Okay, this is section 5.2, power functions. Power functions are actually a special case of something we're going to see later under certain conditions. They're special functions of that. Okay, power functions themselves, what are they? So we've looked at exponential functions that have the form f of x equals p times a to the x. Okay, in an exponential function, the base is a number and the exponent is, an, is the independent variable. Here okay, we're going to reverse that. The base will be the independent variable and the exponent will be a number. So a definition, a power function has the form f of x equals c times x to the k, where c and k are numbers. The number k is called the power of the function. It's the exponent. And as you may have guessed, c is the initial value. Now, power functions, however, when you're looking at the initial values, we always say it's when x is zero. In order for your calculator to model a power function, you're not allowed to have x equals zero. Your calculator cannot handle the regression model if x is zero or if the y is zero. It just can't. So the next slide shows some power functions for positive integer values of k. And so the kind of pink one, that's when k is one. All of these have c equals one, by the way. So if, if, if the k is one, you have y equal x. The blue, uh, excuse me, the red one, that's when k is two, y equals x squared. And the blue one, that's when k is three. And the purple one has k being four. Okay, notice as the value of k gets bigger, that is if the power gets bigger, it gets steeper and steeper. And if we look at what we usually look at, x min is zero and y min is zero, they're all increasing. It's only if I look at the uh, x min being allowed to be negative and the y min allowed to be negative, but I actually start seeing some decreasing, like looking at the red one. It's decreasing and then it starts to increase. But if we look at our usual, that x min and y min are zero, we always have increasing. And the bigger the exponent, the steeper the curve. Okay, on the next slide we're going to show some power functions when the power is a negative integer. It's going to be hard to tell, but all of the graphs are in two pieces. Okay, they are in two pieces, which we don't like. Which, remember, that means we're going to look at the piece for our applications with x min and y min both being zero, which means we're going to look at the pieces on the right. So, again, the pink one is when k is negative one. There's one piece here, and there's another piece over here. It really doesn't break apart. The, the software did this to show the uh, values on the uh, scales. Okay, so notice it's decreasing over here. The uh, red one again is k being negative two. There's a piece here, and there's a piece over here. Again, it's kind of hard to tell. But in the piece that we would do for our uh, applications, our word problems, again, it's decreasing. And notice in the places where we would look at for the word problems, it's concave up. Okay, the guys over here, they're concave down. And the blue one is for k being negative three. There's a piece here, and there's a piece over here. And lastly, the purple one, which is really hard to see because it's blending in with the others. Here is k being negative four. Here's when the x min and y min are zero. And here's where the x min and the y min are allowed to be negative. Now again, we would look at the ones that are over here on the right. So in order to avoid this problem, we usually restrict x to being positive. Okay, again, this is a natural restriction for most of our applications, which means, again, going back to the graphs, we would just look at the graphs that are over here. And notice over here, they're all decreasing and they're all concave up. So decreasing concave up means the rate at which it is decreasing is increasing. So facts about f of x equals c times x to the k for c and x positive, which again are our usual applications. Number one, if k is positive, then the function is increasing. Larger values of k cause the function to increase more rapidly. Again, this is with c and x being positive. Number two, if k is negative, then the function is decreasing. The more negative k is, the more rapidly the function decreases. The limiting value is zero. 
Again, if I go back to that slide, you can see all of these get closer and closer to zero as x takes on bigger and bigger values. Let's try some examples. Everyone says, the law of gravity states that the distance an object falls when dropped from a tall structure is given by d equals 16 t squared, where t is in seconds and d is in feet. Make the graph that shows the distance an object falls versus time if the object is dropped from a height of 100 feet. Question B, how long does it take the object to strike the ground? If necessary, Round your final answer to the nearest hundredth of a second. This law of gravity thing was discovered by Isaac Newton, of course. Okay, so our solutions. Okay, for part A, distance and time cannot be negative, so our x men and y men are going to be zero. So again, let's let's get everything going here. So, a window. Okay, x men zero. Okay, the x max. Notice we're dropping it from a height of 100 feet, so the highest, which is going to be our y max, the highest it can be is 100. It's like we have to kind of estimate how long do we think it would take. So, to be consistent, what did I predict here? So since the object dropped from a height of 100 feet, the y max should be at least 100. So you know we might go a little bit higher than that, 110. So Arbitrator chose the x max to be 5. Okay, I, I thought it could actually hit the ground within 5 seconds. Remember, that's what that's saying. The uh, the t, which is the x on the calculator, is how long it will take. So to make my windows consistent. Okay. So again, I'm thinking 5 seconds. Now, if you wanted to leave it at what the calculator had 5, that would be perfectly fine. Nothing really wrong with that. So 5. One. Okay, uh, no negatives, so zero. And slightly higher than 100, I went to 110. And let's go ahead and keep our scale at 10. Okay, and then, of course, let me quit this. We've got to give the function to the calculator. Okay, so y equal, okay, 16t squared. So remember, our y is playing the role of d, 16x squared. Okay, now before we do this, I've got to make sure my stat plots are turned off, otherwise I'll get an error statement. So second stat plot. Okay, they're all off, but just to be safe, four, enter. Now they're definitely off. So then, graph. Okay. So there's our graph. Okay, there it is on the calculator, on the, on the screen. Now, question B was, how long for it to strike the ground? In other words, I want to find out when it's equal to zero. I want to know when the height, which is the D, which is the Y on the calculator, when that's equal to zero. So we need to find when D is 100. So I'm going to let Y2 be 100 and use the crossing graphs method. So let's see. Y equal. So Y2 is the height of the building. If we're dropping it from a 200-foot building, my Y2 would be 200. So 100. Okay, and hopefully I have enough x value shown. So second calc choice 5. Okay, there's the 100. Y1 16x squared, yes. Y2 100, yes. Guess 2.5, sure, why not? Oh, it's exactly 2.5. Hey, how about that? We got lucky. So the other strikes the round in 2.5 seconds. It was just by sheer luck that our guess was also the answer. Okay, number two. The volume V of a sphere of radius R is given by the following formula. V is equal to four-thirds pi R cubed. Graph V versus R for zero less than R less than six in a suitable viewing window. Okay, these are my x values, zero to six. Okay, because... Remember, when, when the formula is given, the guy that's by himself is y. The one that's over here is part of the formula, that's the x. It says, find the radius of a sphere that has a volume of 200 cubic inches. Round your final answer to the nearest hundredth of an inch. Okay, notice, for question b, um, I'm letting v be 200 and trying to solve r. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and set up our calculator here. 
So clear out these y equals. Okay, now volume is 4 thirds pi r cubed. <clears throat> so I can have, let's see, 4 divided by 3, there's my 4 thirds. Pi is the second of the caret key, pi. And then x to the third power. Okay, get out of that. Now our window. Okay, 0 to 6. 0, 6. Keep the scale at 1. Okay, y min would be 0. Can you get a y max? Um, since I know the largest R I'm going to look at is going to be 6, I can figure out um, what V of 6 would be. So, have I put the, yes, bars, Y bars, function, Y1, of 6. So I get this 904.779. Okay. Remember, I've still got my float to 3. Maybe I should go ahead and turn that back to float. Set my float back to float. But getting this 904 stuff, I'm going to let my y max be a thousand. Thousand. And I'm going to let my y scale be a hundred, since I went out to a thousand. And let's just graph away. You notice for a long time the volume's not very big. Then it's just really going up. It almost looks exponential, doesn't it? So our solutions, okay, again, I use the same x min, x max, and x scale. Okay, and volume can't be negative. Yeah. So I found my y max by figuring out a v of 6. So I went to 1,000 just like before in there. Again, it, do, it does look really almost exponential. That's going to become the issue. How can I tell an exponential model from a power model? Now remember, we did have a test for an exponential model. We didn't have a test for a power model. And there really is no test for in general. Now in certain situations there is a test. But in general, there isn't. Because exponential and power look an awful lot alike. Same question B. I want to find R when V is 200. So if we do this on our calculator, Y equal, let the Y2 be 200. And find out where the intersect. Second calc, choice five. Yes, that's y one. Yes, that's y two. Give us three. Sure, why not? Okay, we're getting three point six two seven eight and so on. So to the nearest hundred, the radius is about three point six three inches. Now, power models have a certain property that we haven't listed yet. So, the homogeneity property of power functions. So, homogeneity property of power functions. Okay, a power function again has the form f of x equals c times x to the k. Okay, we want to know what happens to the value of f of x if x is replaced by a multiple of itself. It's kind of like, what would happen if we doubled the volume? Or what would happen if we doubled the... Uh, height of the building, something like that. So imagine we multiply x by number t. Okay, what happens to f of x? So answer the question, we need to evaluate f of t times x. So back up here, f of t times x is going to be c times tx raised to the k. Now the property of exponent says that this exponent applies to both of those. So I'm going to have c times t to the k, x to the k. And let me do a little rearranging. I'm using what's actually called the commutative property of multiplication, that 5 times 2 is 2 times 5. So I'm going to put the t to the k in front. I'm going to have t to the k times c times x to the k. Notice this thing in parentheses, that's the original f of x, right? f of x is c times x to the k. Right? There's f of x. So this is t to the k times f of x. Okay, that's really what I have. So t to the k times f of x. So what happens to the value of f of x? it gets multiplied by t to the k. So we're going to state this formally. So the fact that I end up with t to the k times f of x, that's the homogeneity property of the power functions. So to state it formally, homogeneity property of power functions. So given the power function f of x equals c times x to the k power, if x is multiplied by a factor of t, 
then f of x is multiplied by a factor of t to the k. So it's whatever number you multiply x by, take that number to the power, and that's what f of x is multiplied by. Let's look at some examples. Okay, number one. The surface area S of a sphere of radius R is given by S is equal to 4 pi R squared. Notice it is a power function. A spherical balloon with a radius of 2 inches is inflated so that its radius is 3 times larger. How many times larger is the surface area? Notice we don't want to calculate the surface area, we just want to know how many times larger it is. Okay, our solution. Okay, we're multiplying the radius by 3. That's our t. Okay, that's our t. We're multiplying the radius by 3 because right there, 3 times larger. Okay, the power is 2. So the surface area gets multiplied by 3 squared. Remember, the power is 2 is 9. So the surface area is 9 times larger. Example number two. The weight W that a beam of length L can safely support is given by W equals 12,000 times L to the negative 1 power. So it is a power function. Suppose that the length of the beam is increased by 25%. How does this affect the weight that the beam can safely support? Express your answer as a percentage. Okay, our solution. Okay, increasing the length by 25% means a new length is given by, okay, now we've done this before, 100% plus 25%, which is 125%, or as a decimal, 1.25. Okay, 1.25. Notice what does this really mean? Okay, the weight that can be safely supported is changed by the factor of 1.25 to the minus 1, because remember, we're increasing the length by 1.25, that's our t. So we're going to take 1.25 to the negative 1 power, you get 0.8, which is 80%. Notice it's less. The beam can support less weight safely. So the beam can now safely support only 80% of what it could before. Remember, the negative exponent, it's decreasing. And we did this without, uh, without ever finding out the actual weight of anything. That is the power of the homogeneity property. Now, we observed before that power functions and exponential functions look an awful lot alike, so power functions versus exponential functions. So again, power functions and, and exponential functions, they look an awful lot alike, especially if the x values are positive and not very large, whatever not very large might mean. So it's only after a sufficiently large value of x will it start to become apparent that you have an exponential function as opposed to a power function. Exponential functions increase much more rapidly than power functions. So in general, we have to be told though which one to use since they're so similar. Now we're going to explore generalizations of the power functions later in this chapter. And there we're actually going to have a test. And in those generalizations, we keep the exponent, the largest exponent, to be a positive whole number. Okay. So when you're not allowing that, power functions and exponential functions, again, look very much alike. But in general, in mathematics, nothing grows faster than an exponential function for a sufficiently large value of x. That's the end of section 5.2.